Welcome to Logistics 101, the disaster logistician. I'm Chris, a logistics section chief, and I'm here to talk to you about the challenging work disaster logisticians perform to support incident response and recovery efforts. During this course, we'll talk about the key goals and critical elements of logistics, as well as the challenges and principles of disaster logistics. I'll introduce you to some of the key staff you'll work with and give you a quick tour of some of the facilities you may work in. We'll also get a chance to talk briefly about some of the sources disaster logisticians use to get all of the resources needed to support incident response and recovery operations. One of the best ways to start thinking about disaster logistics is to consider the goal of logistics in general. Logistics is ultimately about getting the right stuff to the right place at the right time and in the right quantity and condition. That's true whether you're shipping toys around the country for a huge retail chain or delivering medical supplies and life-sustaining commodities to people impacted by disaster. The stuff's just got to get there or we've dropped the ball, and that's easier said than done. There are lots of pieces to every logistics puzzle, and it's up to us to make sure they all fit together. Out of all the elements of logistics, information is probably the most important. If we don't manage information correctly, we won't know who needs what or where anything is. Resource requests are great examples of key pieces of information that have to be properly received, recorded, and responded to. Logisticians also have to carefully track resource inventories and monitor the arrival of new orders and deployments to make sure that they have enough resources to meet their organization's needs. Reports that trigger some sort of action, like scheduling a delivery or ordering new supplies, are more examples of information that needs to be accurately communicated to the right party quickly. Inventories are our way of keeping track of where our resources are located, so tracking inventory is crucial. There's no way we can deliver something if we don't know where to find it in the first place. Tracking inventory is especially challenging in situations where multiple organizations are providing resources to us or requesting resources from us since the inventory is going to be changing constantly. Inventory is often closely tied to warehousing. Warehouses are great locations to efficiently deliver, pick up, and store resources as needed. They allow us to stockpile resources that we know we'll need to distribute at some point and enable us to meet peaks in demand by drawing down those stockpiles as needed. Packaging is sometimes overlooked, but is also very important. Remember that one of the goals of logistics is to deliver resources in the right condition. Packaging protects resources during storage and transportation so they are in the proper condition when they need to be used. If items are going to be distributed to large numbers of people, packaging can also make this process a lot easier. Material handling happens any time one of our people directly handles resources, like loading a truck or prepping a shipment for delivery. Even if we've done everything right up to this point, it's all for nothing if we load the wrong pallet onto a truck. So it's important to have the right procedures in place to make sure that the people working in our warehouses and loading docks don't make mistakes at the last minute. Transportation is obviously an important part of logistics. When we know we've got to move resources from one point to another, it's up to us to decide the best mode of transportation to get them to the right place at the right time. Maybe we need trucks to haul pallets of water from one county to another. Who provides the trucks? How big do the trucks need to be? How will we fuel them? What route will they take? And what will we do if we're unable to move something by truck? Will we be able to utilize other modes of transportation, such as air, rail, or waterways? What are the capabilities and limitations of these various transportation options? These are all questions we need to be able to answer so that we can successfully transport resources into and around the areas affected by an incident. One last element to consider is security. Resources won't be useful to anyone if they're stolen or damaged at any point in the process. So those are the seven elements of logistics. Information, inventory, warehousing, packaging, material handling, transportation, and security. All these elements apply to the work we do as logisticians, but there are many challenges unique to disaster logistics that make our jobs a lot harder. For one, we typically work with a large number of stakeholders, officials from all level of government, private sector representatives, charities, volunteers, all sorts of people have to find a way to work together to serve the victims of a disaster. You'll sometimes find you have to rely on organizations and people you've never heard of before. That's a challenge that many other logisticians don't confront, but it's something we deal with every day. Another challenge is that disaster logisticians often have to rely on imperfect or incomplete information. 
Remember that information is one of the key elements of logistics, so this can cause a lot of problems. During a disaster, just about everyone and everything is pushed to operate at maximum ability levels. People make mistakes, systems crash, the power goes out. So we've got to be able to adapt and operate as best we can with the information available to us. And that brings us to my next challenge, which is that the situation constantly changes during a disaster, especially during the response phase. Resource requirements can change dramatically from one moment to the next, or vital supply routes can suddenly be cut off. You never know what's going to happen next, so we've got to be flexible and creative to adapt to circumstances as they change, and we should always have contingency plans in place and ready to activate if needed. Of course, what really sets disaster logistics apart are the stakes. We often deal with life or death situations where the consequences of failure are extremely high. Whether we're trying to get critical supplies to disaster victims or vital safety equipment to first responders, the people we serve are counting on us to get them through this disaster safely. Despite all of the challenges we face, it's up to us to get them everything they need. The key takeaway here is that it's extremely rare for everything to go right during a disaster, but successful disaster logistics management finds a way to get the right stuff to the right place at the right time, despite all the challenges we face in the process. The principles of disaster logistics are the priorities that we focus on every day. These should influence everything you do as a disaster logistician. If you ever need to make a tough decision and aren't sure what to do, these principles should be able to help you focus on what's important. Let's talk about them before we move on to the rest of the course. Although there's no particular order or ranking of the principles of disaster logistics, we have to start somewhere, so let's talk about contingency first. Contingency is all about having backup plans for your backup plans. Pre-disaster planning and actions are essential. We should know what to do if any plan, system, or process fails during a disaster. Just keep asking yourself, what do I do if X fails? As long as we can always answer that question, we'll be prepared no matter what the situation throws at us. Disaster logisticians need to know, as precisely as possible, where every resource is located at all times. Where is it now? Where is it going? When's it going to get there? What's its condition or status? By using asset tracking systems and technologies, disaster logisticians can essentially see every resource that's relevant to the incident response or recovery effort. Validity can be associated with the concept of verification. It's important to verify resource requests during a disaster. Let's say we've been delivering fuel to a shelter every morning so they can run their generators. Well, at some point, that facility is going to get its power back, and we don't want to waste time and resources shipping fuel somewhere it isn't needed anymore. We need to have processes in place to make sure we're only filling valid requests for resources. It seems like common sense, but if we don't dot our I's and cross our T's, something's going to get messed up eventually. And when we're dealing with situations where people can get hurt if we mess up, it's obvious why we can't tolerate sloppy mistakes in our line of work. So if you get a resource request and aren't sure exactly what the requesting entity needs, figure out a way to confirm the details. If you're entering data into an asset tracker or some other database, do it right the first time and then double check it. That's what accuracy is all about. In large-scale disasters or catastrophes, we know we will be overwhelmed with resource requests and will be unable to immediately fulfill every one of them. We'll need to prioritize the requests. When push comes to shove, we always prioritize life-saving requests, but we've got to be very careful whenever we mark a request as high priority. If the request really isn't vital, or worse, isn't even current anymore, we could waste a lot of time getting stuff somewhere it doesn't need to be. Guidance on how to prioritize requests will be set by the incident or unified commander and passed down to logisticians to ensure that resource prioritization happens in a clear and consistent manner. Capacity is another principle of disaster logistics. It's a bit of a simplification, but think of the entire disaster logistics operation as a hose. There's a whole lot of water that has to go through it, and if the hose isn't big enough, there's no way we'll get enough liquid through the system as fast as we need to. We need to build excess capacity into all our systems and processes. Imagine the worst possible scenario, and then build a logistic system that can handle something even worse. If we don't, when we're hit by those inevitable surges in resource requests, we may reach a point where we can't meet all of the requests in a timely fashion. Obviously, 
We want to avoid that situation wherever possible. Communication is one of the most important principles of disaster logistics. We've already mentioned several times how important information is to disaster logistics. Well, if we're not effectively communicating with one another, there's a good chance we're not sharing key information. As you know, we have to expect the unexpected during a disaster. But if no one tells us when something's wrong, we're not in a position to make things right. For example, let's say the truck convoy we sent out earlier in the day finds that its route's been obstructed. The drivers figure out an alternative route, but never tell us about the obstruction. Well, in the meantime, we've already sent four or five more convoys that way, and now a whole bunch of stuff is going to get delivered late. What we really need was for the first convoy to communicate with us and let us know about the obstruction. If we had known about it, we could have dispatched a crew to clear the road or found an alternate route, and everything would be back on track. Manageability is a reminder that, even though our mission is complex, it's important to simplify our processes and tasks whenever possible. If we can break everything down into manageable parts, we can avoid situations where people are doing multiple things at once and make everyone's job a little bit easier. Accountability means that every resource and every process must have a clearly defined active owner. An active owner is a point of contact responsible for that resource or process. Accountability isn't about knowing who to blame if something goes wrong, but rather about ensuring that nothing falls through the cracks. We just want to make sure that every single resource is on somebody's radar. If we do run into a problem or have questions, we'll always know who we need to talk to. That's why the principles of accountability and communication are closely linked. Most of the resource requests we handle have a certain degree of urgency. But don't forget that timeliness also means that we can't deliver materials too early, either. Let's say we send a truck full of cots to a shelter a day before the shelter expected them. Well, it turns out that volunteers slated to unload the trucks won't arrive until the next day. So now we've got a truck and a driver sitting in a parking lot somewhere waiting for someone to unload the cots. Now we can't use that truck for any more shipments that day, so we'll have to pull in another truck and driver to cover those shipments. As you can imagine, the ripple effects could go on and on. So the principle of timeliness reinforces the idea that an on-time delivery is neither late nor early. The resources simply must arrive at the requested time. When you're working a disaster, I can guarantee you that some things aren't going to go as planned. So every time we run into a brick wall, we've got to be flexible and creative in order to find another way to accomplish our mission. This principle ties back to the concept of contingency we talked about earlier. If we've done our homework ahead of time and have backup plans already in place, our operations are more flexible because we have alternatives we can employ right away if we need to. Logistics is all about coordinating the efforts of numerous people so that resources move through the system efficiently. That's harder than it sounds. Remember that we're working with lots of people from numerous agencies and organizations, each with different priorities and experiences. Some of us have lots of disaster logistics experience, and others haven't even heard of the term disaster logistics before. So we've all got to make an effort to bridge these differences and stay focused on our shared mission. The last principle I'll mention is reusability. This one is usually relevant toward the end of an incident response when we're getting ready to demobilize. During any given disaster, we use a lot of equipment that can be recovered and ultimately reused for another incident. If we've done a good job tracking resources throughout the disaster, it shouldn't be too hard for us to locate this equipment. Once we have it in hand, we have to figure out if it can be reused, needs to be repaired, or should be disposed of. Then we can reposition the reusable equipment so it's right where we need it in the event of another disaster. I know that we just went over a lot of information, but most of the principles of disaster logistics are common sense. I don't want you to feel like you've got to memorize them all. I just wanted to give you a heads up that you'll encounter these principles repeatedly during logistics response operations. They're woven into everything we do here, and I'm sure you'll learn to incorporate these values into your own work as a disaster logistician. Now that you've learned about the principles of disaster logistics, I think you're ready to tour some of the facilities we use during an incident. During the tour, I'll also introduce you to some of the people you'll be working with. Let's start right here at the Logistics Center, or LC. The LC is an expanded version of the typical logistics section found in every jurisdiction's Emergency Operations Center, or EOC. The primary purpose of the LC is to receive resource requests, record them appropriately, 
and ultimately start the process of responding to those requests. The LC coordinator directly oversees LC operations, and everyone here is a member of the LC staff. If you take a look at this map, you can see where the LC is located relative to some of our other facilities. Here it is, right here. You'll notice that this building is labeled as the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center. That's because our LC is located in the same building as the EOC. This isn't always the case, but that's how we're set up for this incident. The EOC is the Coordination Center for Emergency Management Response and Recovery Efforts. Next, let's take a look at our Receiving and Distribution Center, or RDC. After a catastrophe, there may be so many resources pouring into our jurisdiction that we need a place to stage shipments before sending them on to their final destination. If necessary, resources from external sources can be received and staged at an RDC until we figure out where they are most needed. The RDC coordinator works in the EOC and supervises the RDC commander, who is on-site managing the RDC. Okay, back to the map. Next, take a look at the facilities labeled C-Pod. There's one here, here, and here. Let's take a look at this one. A C-Pod, or Commodity Point of Distribution, is a place where vital supplies are distributed to members of communities affected by a disaster. Part of our job as disaster logisticians is to determine whether C-Pods are needed to ensure members of the public have access to life-sustaining commodities, and then make sure C-Pods have everything they need to service the area's population. The C-Pod coordinator, who all the individual C-Pod managers report to, works from the EOC to manage the entire C-Pod operation. Alright, let's look back at the map one last time. There are several other facilities we've marked on the map that we don't have time to visit, but I did want to point out to you quickly. Here's a volunteer and donations call center. That's where local businesses can call if they have supplies they'd like to donate to our response efforts, or individuals can call if they'd like to volunteer their own time and skills to help with the efforts directly. And over here is donations, which is where we'll store the items the businesses have donated, typically water, toiletries, those kinds of things, until we get a request for those resources. So now that you've seen the people and facilities we work with, you may be wondering how we get all the resources we need to support those C-Pods and all of the other incident response and recovery efforts going on throughout this area. Fortunately for us, there are a number of sources we can use to get supplies and equipment. We always try to fulfill a request locally first, from the emergency management stockpile if you have one, or from the various agencies in your jurisdiction. If we can't source a request locally, local governments can turn to their state emergency management agency for help fulfilling a request, and the states can look to the federal government for help with requests they are unable to fulfill. One tool states can use is the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, or EMAC, which is a mutual aid agreement between states. When a disaster response requires more resources than are locally available, EMAC can provide states with a quick response to resource requests and can supplement or replace federal assistance. Of course, many local governments have a number of other mutual aid agreements with other municipalities, cities, and counties, and these can be an invaluable source of resources during a disaster too. And last, but certainly not least, we work closely with a number of private sector partners, many of whom are excellent sources for commodities, supplies, and equipment. Obviously, there's a lot more to being a disaster logistician than the topics we've talked about during this course, but you should have a better understanding of what disaster logistics is all about now than you did when we started. Moving forward, just remember that there are lots of resources available to help you learn more about disaster logistics. Your best bet is to ask your colleagues for help and advice. There's no such thing as a dumb question, and there's no better way to learn about a system or process than to ask someone who has a lot of experience working with that system. There are also other courses, like this one, that you can take if you'd like to learn more about some of the topics we discussed earlier. Logistics 200, the Logistics Center. Logistics 201, Receiving and Distribution Center. And Logistics 202, Commodity Point of Distribution, are all available for you to take at any time. If you know you'll be working at an LC, RDC, or CPOD, then I'd recommend taking the course related to that location next. To find all of the disaster logistics plans and guides that this series of courses is based on, visit the Regional Logistics Program website at www.emergencylogistics.org. Thanks for your attention and for your willingness to serve your community as a disaster logistician.